The next session is on emerging trends in higher education sector in India. We have discussed so many things about the challenges. We have discussed so many things that what is the current scenario of higher education in India. We have discussed what, is the, what are the policies of government uh, in higher education. Now, it really is needed that what good emerging trends are there as far as higher education segment of India is concerned. So for that panel discussion, I like to call on, uh, uh, call on stage various dignitaries that include Dr. Damianti Datta, Associate Dean and Professor IMS Noida, Paul Fier, Chief Executive of Officer, British Accreditation Council, United Kingdom. Thank you, sir. Give him a big round of applause, please. Dilip Chinai, Chairman, Sant Lungawal, Institute of Engineering and Technology, Sangarur, Punjab. Give him a big round of applause, please. <laughs> Professor Jesse Nawang, Semten, Vice Chancellor, Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Vinod Tibrewala, Chancellor, Sri JJT University, Rajasthan. Oh. He is joining in a while, no issue. Next, Professor Maharaj Udin Mir, Vice Chancellor, Central University of Kashmir, Srinagar. He is here. So that's all. Uh, the Medhi ma'am, you have to moderate the session. Thank you for such a nice panel. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you, and uh, thank you for staying so long. It's been a long day already, and uh, thank you to Eglex for inviting me along today as well. Um, I should just start off by saying who we are, who the British, British Accreditation Council is, before I get into the main part of what I've got to say today. Well, first of all, for those of you who don't know about us, and I imagine that's probably most of you, we were set up back in 1984 at a time, uh, if you're old enough like me to recall that Margaret Thatcher was in power in, in the United Kingdom, and she was pulling back from intervention in the private sector in the UK, and we were set up by the British Council and the Department of Education to oversee standards in the further and higher education sector in the UK. So we're a quality assurance agency, and that's what we do. Yeah. Um, we were registered, registered charity and a not-for-profit organization, so all the surpluses we might generate, uh, we don't generate huge amounts of surpluses, I have to say, um, but any surplus we generate gets re, uh, reinvested into the organization. And in terms of our membership, we're full members of ENQA, uh, which is the European Association for Quality Assurance and Higher Education. And ENQA is uh, a pretty exclusive club, very demanding organization, 
and they will inspect the inspectors. So in terms of our quality assurance, we have external quality assurance in ourselves. Uh, and that makes sure that we keep our standards up to date uh, and the way that we work is, is benchmarked against a set of international standards. We're also full members of INQUAHE, which I suspect many more of you will be aware of, uh, and we participate in various conferences and, and consultations around the world as well. At the moment, we accredit around 230 institutions, just over that actually, a little bit more than that, uh, and we operate or accredit institutions in 19 different countries, and we also have two ongoing consultancy projects in two other countries as well. So in that sense, we're pretty international. Now, today I've been asked to spend 10 minutes or so, and I'm aware I've already used up a couple of those minutes, in talking about trends in international higher education. Um, and I wanted to start off by picking up some of the key statistics. One or two people earlier on today have already touched on these. If I'm repeating what you might have heard already, then please forgive me. Um, but in 2014, just to give a scale of some of the student numbers and how student numbers are changing and the way that students are choosing to study, in 2014, it was estimated there's around 5 million students studying outside the home country and higher education. In 1990, that figure was 3.7 million. It's estimated by 2025 the number of students studying internationally outside of their home country will reach 8 million. So you can see there's been a pickup and the pace of change is picking up quite considerably. Coming back to the UK, just to give some figures there, uh, we've got a very high, uh, a very strong higher education sector in the UK. But I didn't know until I was presenting or preparing for this presentation that 21%, that was just last year, 2016 figures, 21% of students in the UK are not British, have actually come from overseas to study in the UK. Uh, looking at where students choose to study, well, 19.4% of students have gone to the USA, 10.4% come to the UK, and beneath that, you have a long list of countries, the majority of which are OECD countries. And I'll come on to LA Trong, one of the trends that's emerging is that that trend, or what we've seen up until now, where students have chosen to go to OECD countries is beginning to change. At an early stage, but nonetheless, there's a change happening there. And just to give some context in terms of India and its relationship with the UK in terms of higher education, in 2014, 2015, there's 18,320 Indian students were studying at higher education in the UK. So what emerging trends can we begin to see? Well, there's a small number of really interesting changes beginning to happen. In my last slide, I talked about the OECD, and that's traditionally where most people think, if I'm going to go and study overseas, I know what I'm going to go and do. I'm going to go to Britain, I'm going to go to USA, Canada, Australia, wherever it might be. But typically, it would have been an OECD country. We're beginning to see some changes in the flows, in international student flows. Specifically, we're beginning to, beginning to see the emergence of regional educational hubs, where students, instead of choosing to go to OECD countries, are staying closer to home. They might still be crossing borders. They might still be studying in another country, but it tends to be more regional. The majority of the students are still studying in OECD countries, but there's an emerging trend, and it's a strengthening trend, and I hope as I go through some of the other slides, you'll be able to see that, and I can give evidence to support that, uh, that students are choosing to travel and study much closer to home. That's being accelerated as we're seeing some of the uh, emerging economies, universities, beginning to rise up through the rankings. You're seeing in Singapore, uh, you're seeing in South Korea, other countries where universities are beginning to establish themselves, beginning to develop international reputations, and that's supporting and attracting students to those areas. Now, just to give uh, an example of this, although the figures are quite old, and one of the problems with international education, getting statistics can be quite difficult, particularly reliable statistics. But in Latin America, in uh, 1919, uh, those students studying within the, the area went from 23%, 23, 23%, sorry, 11% in, in 1999 to 23% in 2007. Within the ASEAN countries, uh, the, over the same period of time, the figures went from 26% to, to 42%. Now, those figures are quite old, they're quite out of date. 
that trend seems to be strengthening and emerging. And that has implications, quite considerable implications for OECD countries uh, and the way they, they manage their student relationships. And uh, I'll come on a little, bit, a little bit later on about branch campuses, although that has been touched on a little bit earlier on today. Well, coming on to India, now I'm, I'm very conscious when I was asked to do this, you probably know far more about what's happening in Indian higher education than I am. But I hope what I've got to say may, may surprise and I hope maybe inform some of your thoughts. Well, in 2007, there was 14 million participants in higher education in India. By 2013, that was 28 million. A near doubling, or it is a doubling, in six years. That's quite a considerable achievement. By 2025, it's estimated there'll be 119 million Indian youths in the age group who can study at universities. That's a huge growth in population. And I suspect that's going to offer unique challenges to Indian higher education sector to meet the demands of those students as they come through. And what I've been very interested in today, I've been listening to various ministers and dignitaries from the higher education sector in India about some of the plans that are afoot. And I have to say how impressive they sounded. Uh, what's happening seems to be quite unique. But there are some problems. And I know this has been recognized and it's been talked about. As it stands today, 33% of in, uh, students finishing their degrees in India remain unemployed. Well, that's an issue that needs to be tackled. There's other areas of development as well. I'm sure you're all aware that Mumbai University is looking for uh, an area within uh, New York, I think it is, or New York uh, State anyway, uh, to, uh, to build their own USA campus. That's a reflection of some of those changes which are beginning to happen and Mumbai University developing its own international reputation and beginning to go overseas to meet the demand in uh, the United States in this particular instance. So, for me, there's some key trends emerging in India. First of all, if I look back to 2012, where the government highlighted, and I think, uh, I might be corrected here, I think it was a tenth, fi fifth year plan, or fi tenth, five year plan, but the government highlighted the need to focus on excellence in teaching, and this is higher education, to focus on excellence in teaching and research to improve graduate and research outcomes. Well, that's all about quality assurance. What we are seeing internationally, and it's not just India, we're seeing this globally, is a focus on quality assurance and making sure that students, when they go to university, and they're increasingly being asked to contribute to the cost of their own study, that the, the education they receive is meaningful. And that's as valid as it, as it, in India as it is in the UK, where we all constantly are going through uh, the quality assurance process and how to improve that quality assurance process. So the outcomes of students actually improved as well. In 2016 uh, in India, a new quality assurance agency was launched. You probably know better than me how that's progressing, but I understand when it was launched it had a budget of 1.5 uh, billion US dollars, which is what some quite considerable budget. Um, how that's progressed, I wasn't able to find out. I'd be delighted if I could find somebody who could fill me in, perhaps, at the break. The, the focus of the new accreditation body, or quality assurance agency, is to strengthen the accreditation system for universities, whether they're private or public, to aim to double the number of qualified faculty within universities, shifting the assessment of students' progress to a uh, credit-based system to allow greater fix flexibility and to make sure the degrees that are awarded are recognized internationally, so this international benchmarking take place. And two examples that in my research sprung out, although listening to people speaking today, I think I've probably missed many more very good examples, but the states of Gujarat and Tamil Nadu are working to build employability skills for the students and developing exchanges and international collaborations with partners in the UK and elsewhere. Now, those are India specific, but if we look across the globe, that is happening around the world. For me, those are the key trends, the very broad macroeconomic trends, if you like, across the higher education sector. I'm conscious that I'm probably coming to the end of my time, so I'm going to wrap up my uh, slideshow here, and uh, I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierre.
for this excellent presentation. I think we touched on two topics. How do we preserve the quality of learning? We are doing everything, but the quality of learning is very important. And also in the case of global recession, as a and then uh, talk about India and talk about some of the changes that are happening in India and then what the future will hold. So if you look at the world and we, you know, we, in conferences like this, we tend to discuss education on the extreme right. You know, what are all the changes happening? But actually the education systems in different countries differ according to the type of industrialization. So if you take the least developed countries, I mean, their prime thing is, you know, they're not very, they're early industrialized, but their higher education is typically for the elite. There is no elite. There is no, uh, you know, uh, thing like when you go to the emerging economies, where, where it includes uh, China, India, the Arab world, and Southeast Asia, some of the countries that you talked about, where there's a massification of uh, higher education, big universities, but principally qualification driven. That's what we've been hearing throughout the day: qualification driven and knowledge focused uh, uh, education. And then you have the developed nations, which are looking at the effects of post-industrialization and new teaching approaches and focus on skills, competencies, etc. So what you're seeing happening now is the least developed countries also are creating modern educational institutions that are going to replicate what is happening in the developed world, but very, very small numbers. And the emerging economies are actually trying to transform their own education system into what's happening in the developed world. And while the developed world is also changing their education system. So we are in this constant uh, state of flux as we go along. And this is primarily because, first, there's a new demand caused by businesses. So if you heard, you saw the last, uh, last session and you saw the presentation by the Rajasthan uh, Principal Secretary of Education, he talked about Internet of Things, you know, big data, uh, business analytics, artificial intelligence, three years ago, or two and a half years ago, these things were not on the lexicon of the education in, in the country. So that's actually new customer demands, new regulatory standards when you're going for an accreditation or when you're having uh, organizations, say we are number one ranked, and the, like you talked about the changes in the regulatory framework and what you're trying. And in order to outdo the uh, competitor, you're trying to do innovation, you're trying to do changes in the process and systems to be number one in ranking. And interestingly, just like the emergence of OYO rooms uh, in India, or if you take Airbnb abroad, or Uber and uh, Ola, their lar largest hotel chains and largest taxi fleets without owning either the hotel room or without owning the, the taxi. So are we going to have this phenomena and say that education institutions that don't hold brick and mortar, actually the largest education systems in the world, there are some, but we are seeing a huge change in new content and organizational forms of education. In India, throughout the morning, you've heard about UGC, you had the chairman of AICT here in the inaugural and the panel. And of course, they go, themselves are going to be replaced by the higher education empowerment uh, you know, regulation agency. And the, the challenge of the acronym HERA has got contradictions in the words itself there. Then you have these 20 universities, 10 private, 10 public, which are going to be moved out of the whole regulatory uh, scheme as we go forward. Very quietly, the triple IT bill and the IAM bill and the IIT bills have been passed, giving greater autonomy. You've heard about the credit-based, choice-based uh, systems that we're talking about, and MOOCs. And interestingly, this autonomy issue is actually going to address a lot of the problems that the colleague from Kerala raised, because they're saying that you might be affiliated to a university today, but the colleges can become autonomous and can do their own stuff. And this has actually created a divide in all colleges and universities, some supporting it, some uh, actually opposing it. But autonomy is going to actually go forward. You also have the UGC, uh, the open and distance uh, education rules that were announced and withheld. And you know, again, there have been quotes. So there's a huge thing happening, which is in, uh, at the moment, not very clear. And the new committee for the new education policy, this is the third committee that has been set up in the last three years. So the whole regulatory uh, framework is also going to be changing in India 
as we go along. Very interestingly, you know, there's an emergence of private universities. The private universities are a little more flexible than the government-run systems, and they're introducing no course, as you heard, you know, the liberal arts kind of approach, the choice of selection of subjects. If you see the private engineering colleges, they're already teaching, you know, uh, B.Tech in new data, you know, B.Tech in, in uh, Internet of Things, which are not there in the other things. So it's a new kind of subjects being introduced. Then you can select subjects. You have Ashoka, you have Shiv Nadar, you have other universities there, which are saying you can choose physics with uh, economics and with philosophy and actually put your own degree together and do something. Now this is actually happening in, in, in a very quiet way across in India. There are a lot of courses that are linked to industry. So you are saying that this is a course by the logistics sector, or this is by JBM, or this is by IBM, and, and these courses are being introduced there in the private. And then you have the twinning arrangements, which you have heard uh, much more in, in, in the morning. What is interesting is that we have new teaching methodology. If you look at what's happening in the private uh, universities, much faster than the government-run institutions, is that new forms of teaching, they already have MOOCs libraries, they already have simulators, they're already getting industry experts to come in. And you've heard right throughout the day, addition of skills courses, either with the sector skill councils or without the sector skill councils, a single skill or a multiple skill. Now what's gonna happen is, because of pressures on the different colleges to compete and attract students, uh, this is going to multiply and come Come, uh, you know, going to really uh, take off. And the challenge is that regulation would not always be able to keep pace with the change. And the, you know, like the ISB started without being accredited to AICT and became a great uh, educational center. A lot of private educational players and technology education players will try and do things to keep ahead of the regulatory framework. This is the same point that you made: the flight of the student. I don't know if, you, if, if it is true, but according to some estimates, the amount of money spent by Indian students pursuing higher education course overseas far exceeds the investment that the Indian government does in higher education. So you're having, you know, because if you haven't got, you know, the air, air in the morning you heard the air wave, 92.5 FM, you, know, you heard that. If you don't have that, you don't get into Delhi University. So people are going out even now to do undergraduate courses overseas. Earlier they used to go to the OECD countries. Now nations have decided that their cost of living is lower than the OECD countries. So if they provide the same facilities there. People will come there and contribute to their economy rather than going to the OECD uh, countries. Enrollment on online courses is increasing. If you look at the sum total of the enrollment of co online courses in India, it exceeds the university enrollments. The number of people competing courses online is far less. And of course, higher education is now seen as investment and as... Uh, so what's happening is, around the world, is they're moving to the next best practice, work and internship, and I was hoping he would be here, but Mr. Vishweshwara, VIT Pune, has got 35,000 students who are doing a learn and earn program. Working in companies will end up with a degree, with a diploma, which is much more than the enrollment of private or government engineering colleges as increasing. Moving from gurukuls to shishakuls, that is institutional centered learning to individual centered learning, team learning, group projects, internships, online simulators are here to stay. What is going to come is biometrics and variable feedback learning, personalized learning. You heard the, the Macro Hill presentation in the morning. We have the digital network system in India where your, uh, your degrees and mark sheets are going to be online. You're actually going to carry your competency with you maybe in a, in a chip, not in your head, but in a chip where you can prove to your employer and the, uh, that you actually possess those competencies and then the whole accreditation system will also going to change. So what will change in the future? The grammography students. Today, at the, in the age of 17 and 25, you have a peak of people entering the education system. Onwards, it'll be lifelong learning, and there may be two peaks. You might have three generations of students in the same institution. The grandfather, the father, and the grandson. They might actually be studying different things in the institution. 
The nature of classroom is going to change, it's changing today. The process of delivery of knowledge has changed today already, it's going to change faster. And the way you access education, the number of practicals and learning, uh, learning experiences. You know, in the medical education system, we won't have human cadavers to work on. So we will now have simulators. So earlier where 20 people used to go around a cadaver, each one may have his own personalized system, but it'll be a virtual simulated thing. Maybe chemistry and physical, physics laboratories may not exist. Chemical, definitely not on three years because the amount of pollution that is controlled by the amount of sulfuric acid and all that they produce. So we're gonna have a different system of actually practical and, 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 and much more practice with experience and today the biggest challenge in India is that on the job training experience is very difficult, but through artificial reality and artificial, uh, augmented reality and artificial intelligence, you might replicate the factory floor in the classroom where each student can get it. There is a company that is being done by a 22 year old that exists in Delhi, is doing it for Johnson & Johnson in Bombay. It's a reality. The, it'll only scale as we go forward. The mix of competency will change. Rating and rankings are in for a huge, huge change. Just last week, I think, the rating system, the ranking system in India has added on a whole new elements. Maybe another four months, we'll see some new elements coming in. So what you say, stability, I know, you know I'm speaking in, in the presence of the experts, but it's going to happen. So in the future, the nimble and those willing to lead. So if you're board of studies, if you're academic council, and if you're senate, can quickly revamp the curriculum can revamp, revamp the types of courses that you offer and you put it out into market six months before the courses start, you will survive. Because at the end of four years, when your people pass out, let's say in engineering, 50% of what they have learned in the first two years has got the potential to be redundant. So you'll always be playing, be playing catch up. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shiron. So we touched on this wonderful topic, uh, the problems in education, especially in a growing population, fast growing population like India. Private, privatization of education has become omni, omnipotent. It is because they can react instantly to the demands and they don't have to bother as much as of the rules and regulations. They can be more flexible with the tying up with MOOCs, integrating MOOCs into their strategy offering a combination of different subjects, unlikely subjects uh, uh, to the students, uh, whether tied up with universities abroad, offering different, you know, non-conventional subjects like personality development and etc. And the other thing is, all over the world, uh, because of recession, um, as I mentioned, I know I go about it, but whether in OECD countries or other countries, universities or uh, uh, institutes of higher education are interested in attracting uh, students from abroad who can pay the full fees. That has become important. So Indian students are taking advantage of it and they are going abroad. So I would, without much ado, I would invite uh, Professor Samten, Vice Chancellor, Central Institute of Higher Education Studies, to shed more light on what else can be done, what are the more emerging trends in higher education. Well, Um, the moderator of the panel, the co-panelists, and the friends. Um, this session is on emerging trends in education. So I would like to, we have been speaking about uh, the skill developments and the digital world and the education, you know, the, the um, ways and things like that. So I would like to draw you, you know, your attention to a different uh, um, direction. Uh, in the last uh, um, 15, 20 years, there has been a very fundamental change uh, in the concept of uh, education. Actually, in India, what we know education from the early age is uh, shiksha, which means uh, transformation of, uh, you know, mind and the personality. But now the education, the word education has reduced it to external kind of information and uh, developing some skills and things like that and which has externalized our whole kind of perspective to such an extent that we forget our own mind and ourselves, right? 
and then we try to seek everything from outside and we try to seek happiness from outside so which is uh, absolutely the wrong you know way that uh, uh, way to you know expect because now this is uh, um, in in the modern world uh, particularly in united states and european countries and C canada and australia there has been a kind of emerging kind of research in uh, uh, the in 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 um, uh, in psychology and clinical science and uh, the uh, neuroscience, neuro neuropsychology, uh, that uh, the, they studied uh, uh, in the last 12, 15 years that uh, how we can have a you know, better or, a, or a happier kind of life. Uh, so earlier the science uh, used to be very much, you know, directed towards the external world, but now in the last, uh, as I said, a little bit over a decade, they have started uh, studying about, you know, mind and training mind. And as a result of which, uh, you can see as uh, MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction training has been, uh, you know, found to be, is regarded to be a very successful kind of program to reduce, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, stress and depression and things like that. And somebody was telling this, uh, you know, uh, earlier in one of the session that there's a problem uh, with our children uh, with regards to the attention. So there is already attention deficiency crisis, which is a universal crisis. Now this has become. But now the mindfulness-based uh, uh, training has uh, proven to be a very helpful device to develop uh, attention. And so these are now being introduced in the schools, in European schools and in American schools and in adult camps and things like that. So which I think is a big change. And now we should bring these uh, you know, uh, trends in our education system. Um, because earlier it was regarded, uh, uh, even in, in India, even today it is regarded as uh, IQ as the most important kind of, you know, thing on the basis of which the success is, uh, you know, measured. But now in the West, uh, uh, this has not uh, been the case. And IQ as well as EQ is equally regarded important because uh, with all the corporates, when they recruit people, uh, CEO or whatever important kind of you know uh, people in their you know company, then they uh, measure the IQ as well as EQ, emotional you know quotient, right? If the person emotional co quotient means uh, if the person is able to manage his or her own emotions and is also able to manage the emotions of you know the colleagues and at workplace then that makes the corporate successful, right? And that makes the corporate uh, more uh, happier place to work at. So therefore these days, now it has uh, become a kind of a universal phenomenon, particularly in the Western world, that the corporate uh, people are, you know, uh, regarded to be well equipped with the emotional intelligence as well. So therefore, the emotional uh, IQ, the intelligence uh, quotient is regarded to be, you know, a, a kind of a success, uh, um, a, a kind of, you know, sign for success uh, in uh, career, but uh, emotional quotient is regarded to be a, a sign for, uh, you know, success in life and success in, uh, you know, work. So therefore, the person who is well-versed and has a very good uh, IQ may not necessarily end up being a good worker. So therefore, it, these kind of things are very much, uh, as we have been discussing this morning, somebody uh, you know, referred to Nalanda University, ancient university. Nalanda University, ancient university, was all about uh, training of mind and understanding of mind. Now you can see that in uh, chemistry, how many element, uh, elements are there? About 122 elements, right? Now, amazing thing is that, uh, according to Nalanda tradition in Buddhist philosophy and uh, psychology, there are 122, you know, mental uh, elements. So you know, uh, now you can see, in the external world, there are 120, uh, around 120, you know, elements, mat you know, material elements. And now, because the, the external world and the internal world 
the whole, you know, constitute our life. Our life, the half of our life is external life, and half of our, our, of our life is internal, uh, you know, life. And our half of the internal life influences our external life. Therefore, the, in reality, the external life on which we have been, and we emphasize a lot and spend, uh, you know, 100% of our, you know, time, constitute just simply the 25% of our life. So the 75% of our life is very much related to our mind. And now to understand our mind, and then how these kind of the good, you know, the negative mental elements and the positive mental elements to study all these things. For example, anger. What is the nature of anger? How n anger comes, arises, and under what circumstances uh, anger arises, what are the causes and conditions of anger, and what are the implications of anger and consequences of anger. If we study all this holistically, then we can understand what actually anger is, right? And on the opposite side, what compassion is, what are the causes and conditions of compassion, and what are the implications of compassion, and things like that. If we study the entire kind of, you know, the world of uh, compassion, and then we can understand the, you know, the qualities of compassion and the benefits of compassion. When somebody, you know, meditates and cultivates compassion, people think that, they, why should I be compassion, you know, compassionate? The, f the wonderful thing is that when a person, you know, cultivates a compassion, then the first beneficiary is the per person himself or herself. And on the contrary, whenever we have, you know, the, the anger in our mind, the first victim is the person who has the anger, right? So therefore, if we don't want to be unhappy, then we have to work on our mind. And the tradition of Nalanda has a very rich and detailed tradition of how to train our mind. This is all about the Nalanda tradition. It has a so rich, it, you know, the entire Nalanda tradition uh, comprises about more than 5,000 texts translated into Tibetan language, which is not only being studied, but the living tradition is still existent and the, you know, it is being practiced. So therefore, the, in the modern world now, in the United States, Harvard University, uh, Yale University, Stanford University, Emory University, they have a very strong research center of emotional training, emotional uh, compassion training, and uh, you know, uh, and, and mind trainings. And strangely, you might be you know uh, surprised to know that the United States has uh, seven, 27 states of United States has now legally approved to teach adults and children about mind training, training your mind, how to develop compassion, and how to control your negativities, right? So actually in the United States, any kind of religious you know, element uh, is entertained in the public uh, uh, education center that is never tolerated. But now this has become a very kind of uh, important trend accepted in education and public sectors because they are based on scientific researches. So therefore, I think in India, we should uh, try to bring these kind of education systems in our schools. Somebody, you know, discussed about, uh, talked about, uh, you know, bringing uh, education of ethics in the schools. Bringing ethics uh, does not mean that if you, you know, tell them what do's and don'ts, that simply is not the education of ethics. You should tell them why one should not do this. Why should one do this? When one has a complete understanding of uh, what, why one should do this and why sh one should not, then on the basis of one's own understanding, there will be a first-hand kind of you know, uh, practice. And that can be followed. And that can you know, flourish in, 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 in one's life. So therefore, if we are really smart, then we can hold the key of our hand, happiness in our hand. Otherwise, very smart person, regarded to be a very smart person, if he, he or she is ignited by some word or some kind of action by some, some other person, the person becomes totally disturbed, right? Because his or her key of happiness does not lie in his or her hand, but in somebody else's hand. 
if we are really smart, then we can keep the key of our happiness in our hand so that if, you know, we cannot be disturbed and we may not be made unhappy, right? So therefore, these are the, actually, the core element of ancient Indian culture, which we need now to be revived and brought into our education system, which once was the core element of education system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chef. So, I remember as part of um, an elective course I did at Indian Institute of Management, Tamitaba, we worked 200 meters in a very dark jungle where there were leopards and all in the trees. Um, and you, you wouldn't believe it, the smartest or the brightest students of the class, many of them were not able to do it. So that was very interesting, and I think that is what he is referring to. We have so much going on in the external world to help us invite, to improve the quality of learning. But if we do not improve our inner self, I don't think it will be successful. So finally, I invite uh, Dr. Pinot Tibrawala, Chancellor, Sri JJT University, Rajasthan, to shed light on this uh, emerging further, all these diverse emerging trends in higher education. Enlightened gathering today has assembled, I will say in very small words, in very short. We are all patient. Our education, higher education system, specifically I am talking about engineering and medicine. Become CA, LLB, Arts, Fine Arts, they are all very fine with us. But engineering and medical education, death table par hum hai. Since morning hum sun rahe hai, 20% people are employable. 80% are not employable. Kya ho gaya? Aap padhate ho, phir 20% ko kyo nokri milegi? हम डेथ टेबल पर हैं ऑपरेशन की जरूरत है लेकिन हम ऑपरेशन करना नहीं चाहते हम उससे भागना चाहते हैं कॉलेज में बच्चे नहीं आ रहे हैं हमने चेयरमैन साहब को सुना कॉलेज बंद कर देंगे अरे भैया कॉलेज में बच्चे क्यों नहीं आते हैं आईआईटी के लिए 20 लाख लोग क्यों अपीयर होते हैं उनको पढ़ना है इसके लिए होते हैं सुधारोगे कैसे उस पे सोचने के लिए कोई तैयार नहीं है देखिए आज दुनिया को एक्सेलेंट प्रोडक्ट मिलता है जीरो डिफेक्ट मैं इंडस्ट्री का आदमी हूँ मैं एजुकेशन में इसलिए आ गया कि ट्रस्ट की एजुकेशन स्कूल थी और मैं ट्रस्ट का प्रेसिडेंट बन गया बन गया तो मैं बॉम्बे यूनिवर्सिटी का सीनेट मेंबर भी बना एकेडमिक काउंसिल का मेम्बर भी बना मैं ये सब देखा देख के मेरे को ये समझ में आ गया कि अभी अपने को इंजीनियरिंग की जो एजुकेशन सिस्टम है इसको चेंज करना पड़ेगा छः महीना पढ़ाओ छः महीना काम करने के लिए भेजो फैक्ट्री में चार साल का कोर्स आपका है आप दुनिया भर की मैं मैकेनिकल इंजीनियरिंग किया नागपुर से 1968 में 18 सब्जेक्ट हीट इंजन फलना धिमका काम आ, काम मेरे एक आया फैब्रिकेशन फैक्ट्री के अंदर मेरे को वेल्डिंग करना पड़ा गैस कटिंग करना पड़ा फॉर्मिंग करना पड़ा आप एक स्पेशलाइजेशन करो दो साल तक आप सब जनरल सिखा दो दो साल आप उसको स्पेशलाइजेशन उसको यदि सीट मेटल करना है तो उसको कैसे मोल्ड बनाना वो सिखाओ प्रेस का काम सिखाओ ही बी एम्प्लॉयबल वेल्डिंग करना है उसको वेल्डिंग इंजीनियर बनाओ आपको उसको पेंटिंग करना है उसको पेंटिंग का पूरा नॉलेज दो आपको उसको जो स्पेसिफिक लाइन में जाना है उसकी उसको आप दो साल लाइन दो तब आपकी ये एजुकेशन सिस्टम एम्प्लॉयबल हो जाएगी स्किल्ड इंडिया का मतलब यही है हिंदुस्तान सोने की चिड़िया था क्योंकि वो ढाके की मलमल अंगुली में से अंगूठी में से निकलती थी हम सब स्किल्ड कारीगर थे हमारे पास स्किल्ड थी आज स्किल्ड नहीं है क्योंकि हम वही मैकेनिकल इंजीनियरिंग में 18 सब्जेक्ट किस लिए पढ़ा रहे हैं 
मैं शुरू में पूछा मैं मैं गया मैं बोला भाई अभी आप ये सेंट्रल लेथ पे सिखाते हो एक पिलर डीलिंग मशीन है एक वेल्डिंग ट्रांसफार्मर है इलेक्ट्रॉनिक इंजीनियर भी वो कर रहा है वर्कशॉप वो वह हैंड ऑल ट्रेनिंग फर्स्ट ईयर की काय के लिए कर रहा है वॉट आर वी रियली डूइंग हम तमाशा कर रहे हैं किसी आदमी को सर्जरी करने की ज़रूरत है ये सारी एजुकेशन सिस्टम को बदलना करना पड़ेगा मैं यूनिवर्सिटी में एक हॉस्पिटल खोला 300 बेड का एम डॉक्टर को इंटरव्यू के लिए पूछा मैं बोला भाई ऑपरेशन थिएटर में जाओगे बोला ऑपरेशन थिएटर में तो हमको जाना ही नहीं अलाउड है अरे साढ़े पाँच साल तू पढ़ा भाई तू ऑपरेशन थिएटर में नहीं जाने जाएगा तो करेगा क्या बोला हमको अलाउड ही नहीं है एम करेगा तो अलाउड है अरे तो भाई दो साल तीन साल उसको जनरल पढ़ा दो फिर दो साल उसको जो पढ़ना है आँख का पढ़ना है आँख का पढ़ाओ उसको मेडिसिन पढ़नी है मेडिसिन पढ़ाओ फिर उसको काम काम लायक तो बनाओ फिर बाद में वो एम करेगा फिर फेलो करेगा दस ग्यारह साल क्या कर रहे हैं हम वॉट आर वी रियली डूइंग वी हैव टू चेंज दिस इंटायर सिस्टम यदि इसको ऑपरेशन नहीं करेंगे तो ये काम होने वाला नहीं है हम तो इंडस्ट्री से आए हैं मैं ऑल इंडिया स्मॉल स्केल इंडस्ट्रीज एसोसिएशन का वाइस प्रेसिडेंट हूँ कोसिया का हम रात दिन ये देख रहे हैं कि एक भी लड़का जो भी आता है पहले उसको छः महीना हमको ट्रेन करना पड़ता है मैं जब नागपुर से पढ़ के गया तो चुपचाप जो वेल्डिंग करता था ना उससे वेल्डर से सीखता था मैं कि यार कितने करंट पे पाँच एम mm की वेल्डिंग होगी कितने में क्या होगा फिर पोरोसिटी है स्लैग है ये एक्सरे देखने का तो आप एक्सपर्टाइज करो ना आप एक्सपर्ट स्किल बनाओ ये एजुकेशन सिस्टम रूटीन हो गई है अब इसको चेंज करना जरूरी है ऑपरेशन करने के लिए आप सब पढ़े लिखे लोग हो मैं तो बोल सकता हूँ कि ज़रूरत है आपको बदलने की ज़रूरत है बदलोगे तो ठीक है इसके लिए इंडिया बनेगी सोने की सोने की इंडिया सोने की चिड़िया कहलाती थी बन जाएगी क्योंकि प्लम्बर को अमेरिका में मास्टर के जितना पैसा मिलता है आप एक अच्छी प्लम्बिंग कर लो आप अच्छी कारपेंट्री कर लो आप अच्छे स्किल्ड वर्कमैन बनाओ तो आपका काम बनेगा आपका देश बढ़ेगा आप आगे बढ़ोगे नहीं तो भैया जहाँ है पचास साल पीछे लोकोमोटिव से सिखाते हैं अपन स्टीम लोकोमोटिव 600 किलोमीटर की स्पीड की ट्रेन की बात करते हैं और सिखाते क्या हैं सीएनसी मशीन तो किसी कॉलेज में इंजीनियरिंग में है ही नहीं मैं बोला भाई ट्रक पे ले जाओ सीएनसी मशीन दस कॉलेज के अंदर वो जाके ट्रक के ऊपर जाके ले जाके पंद्रह पंद्रह दिन उस कॉलेज के बच्चों को सिखा देगी शेयर आप नहीं अफोर्ड कर सकते हो शेयर करो आप शेयर करके अच्छी मशीनों में सिखाओ अभी वो टेक्सटाइल का एक एग्जांपल दिया कोला 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 इच्छल करण जी का कि भाई वहाँ सब लोगों ने मशीनें दे दी अरे तो मशीन दे दी तो वो कुछ काम हुआ ना तो अच्छी मशीनें होगी तो ही हम सीख पाएंगे तो ही हम पढ़ पाएंगे और तब ये देश बनेगा और ऑपरेशन करने के लिए बहुत सख्त आदमी की ज़रूरत है बहुत ज़बरदस्त जिसको ऑपरेशन करना क्योंकि ये जो पुराने पीढ़ी के लोग हैं ना ये चेंज करने के लिए तैयार नहीं है दे आर नॉट रेडी टू चेंज और चेंज इज एवरी डे हैपनिंग इन लाइफ एवरी डे टेक्नोलॉजी चेंजिंग एवरी डे आज कुछ है कल दूसरा आ गया ये मोबाइल का ये लोग पाँच सात छः आ गया सात आ गया जी पी फोर आ गया रोज चेंज हो रहा है और हम चेंज होने को तैयार नहीं हैं तो ये बड़ी मुश्किल की बात है आप सब पढ़े लिखे लोग हो कोई गलत बात कह दी हो तो माफ़ी मांगता हूँ लेकिन हकीकत यही है कि हमें चेंज करना पड़ेगा और नहीं चेंज करेंगे तो हम आगे नहीं बढ़ेंगे तो बहुत ज़रूरी है थैंक यू वेरी मच मुझे यहाँ पर बुलाया ऑर्गेनाइजर्स ने और बोलने का मौका दिया धन्यवाद Every strategy was linked to the demand. What Sam was just talking about. Every strategy is linked to demand. Unfortunately, teaching that to the students, I was forced to tell them that you know that's not what happens in companies. There's politics. There's so many things. There's rules. There's regulations. So you have to go by rote, and that's.
Thank you so much, all the panelists, for such an enlightening section, session on uh, emerging trends in higher education section scenario in India. I request Dr. Datta to present mementos to each and every participant in the panel discussion. Paul Fear, CEO, British Accreditation Council, United Kingdom. Next, Professor Jesse, so sorry, Professor Vin Dr. Vinod Tebrewala, Chancellor, Sri Jayjati University, Rajasthan. <laughs> Professor Jesse. Nagwang Samten, Vice Chancellor, Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies. <laughs> Dilip Junai, Chairman, Sant Longawal, Institute of Engineering and Technology, Sangarur, Punjab. <laughs> I request Paul Fear, CEO, British Accreditation Council, United Kingdom, to represent the memento to Dr. Damianti Datta. I request each and every panelist to hold their mementos in their hand and pose for a photograph together. Thank you. Thank you, Damianti Manam. Thank you, Dilip, sir. Thank you, Paul.